Okay, I don't know if it's the weather or just the the brightness in the mornings, but in my own mind, I feel like we're we're kind of winding down and, and coming to the end of this module, even though we still have a couple of weeks to go. By giving ourselves three lectures a week instead of the two plus the tutorial, I think we have kind of earned ourselves the right to start st just having tutorials from now on, really. One thing we haven't addressed yet is audio and how audio is represented and coded. So I think we'll do that next week. <coughs> I have half a, half a plan for that next week that I'm not sure will, will pan out, but we'll do that next week. The last time I ran this module, at the end of it, there was a couple of things I was saying, oh, I forgot to tell them about this and I forgot to tell them about that. And so I'm going to do two of those things today that I, w I want, to, want to talk about. One follows on from the video quite naturally, the other just is out of the blue really, but I didn't know where else to, to fit it in in the module. So the first thing we're going to talk about in today's class is the buyer filter. And the second thing we're going to talk about is interlacing in video. And we're also going to look at a tool for recoding video, or we sometimes call that transcoding, and that's called handbrake. So, if you imagine in your digital camera, or in some sort of a scanner, or in your camera, in your phone, or in some handheld video camera, we know, for example, that pixels are represented in digital images by their RGB values and each pixel has a red value and a green value and a blue value. And it's tempting to think that if you were to get a magnifying glass and zoom in somehow and look at the physical piece of hardware that we might see sensors and that each sensor can register a red value, a green value, and a blue value. So if we look at that, if we look at this bag here, let's say this was a, the sensor, these were the sensors on the chip, okay? It's tempting to think that this one here would have an RGB value, this one here comes back with an RGB value, this one here comes back with an RGB value, and this one here comes back with an RGB value, and so on. And actually that's not the case. Typically, in a, in a digital camera, the sensors aren't that sophisticated. And so what happens is, instead of having each pixel or each sensor that's representing a pixel come back with an RGB value, typically what we have is we have sensors that are only sensitive to the amount of light. So they're actually quite unsophisticated, really. They just come back saying how bright something is or isn't. And then over those sensors, we overlay filters. So these sensors here will come back with the amount of brightness that they're experiencing. And by putting a blue filter over this one, it comes back with the amount of blueness. You know, and this one here comes back with the amount of greenness. So the filter will block out everything except the blue light. So this sensor here will register how much blue light is coming to it. If we didn't have any filter, it would just register how much light in total. And this filter here is blocking everything but the red light. And so what you have then is a bunch of sensors come back with their values. And some of them are telling you how much redness they've experienced. Others are telling you how much greenness they've experienced. And others are telling you how much blueness was in what they got. There's no one sensor coming back with an RGB value. And they're organized in a pattern 
that was first devised by a man called Bayer. And it's this pattern here where you have alternating lines of blue, green, blue, green, blue, green, and red, green, red, green, red, green. And so to get the RGB value then of any one spot, we have to interpolate. So if we look, say, um, not there, not there, it's not there. If we look here at this pixel here, we don't have a blue value for that. We got the blue value for this and the blue value for this and the blue value for this and the blue value for this. We have to have a guess at the blue value of this one. Hazard a guess at the blue value of this one. Hazard a guess at the blue value of this one. And hazard a guess at the blue value of this one. And guess the blue value of this one as well. We don't have any red value for this one here. Using the red values around it, we just have a go. Interpolate. Interpolating the green ones is easier. There are many more green ones. So if we know this value, this the green value of this pixel, the green value of this pixel, the green value that would correspond to this pixel, and the green value that would correspond to this pixel, we can have a good, fairly good guess at the likely green value of this pixel. So for any pixel you're looking at, all you actually had in reality was the actual red or green or blue value. You had one of them and the other two were interpolated. This can sometimes lead to artifacts where you might find, particularly in old, shabby, not so great cameras, you might find that there's a little kind of a, a red halo might appear around something. You know, the red had actually stopped cold, but it was interpolated beyond where it was in reality and things like that. So you don't actually have, it for each pixel, you didn't actually scan a red and a green and a blue value. All you got was one value for each one and the other two were interpolated. It turns out that because of the fact that human vision isn't equally sensitive to red and green and blue, that we have way more green than we have the other two. In fact, there are as many greens as there are reds and blues put together. So it does mean that when your sensor comes back with all this information, the green value of this pixel was that, the redness of this pixel was that, the blueness of that pixel was that, you have to do some maths then to have a guess to interpolate what the RGB value of each pixel would have been. And so there's math, some math involved there. It's possible to import the raw data from the camera. And you might, if you have an application that imports images from a camera, and if you have a, a high-end camera, it might say to you, do you want to import it raw? And that's what it's talking about. It hasn't actually... <coughs> It doesn't do any interpolation, it just imports it as is. So let's go back there to see if there's anything I'm missing. Now, some people or some, some companies have come up with alternatives to the Bayer pattern. So, for example, Fuji came up with this one, which it believes to be a superior scheme. And Fuji uses this one, which it believes to be superior. Again, you notice there's a lot more green than there is the red and the blue. And it's because we don't, in general, build sensors that are sensitive to redness and greenness and blueness, and they spit out an RGB value at us. They just spit out an intensity value of the light that's coming to them and we put filters over them. I thought I had a picture of an actual sensor where you can see the actual, the actual filters, but I've lost it, okay. And so you do need to do some math in order to extrapolate the red, green, and blue values. The idea? 
So I'm not sure where that fits in with the rest of the module, but I felt it would be remiss of me to not tell you about it. So most cameras, although they tell us the RGB value for each pixel is whatever, in fact, they only had a red value for some of them, a green value for some of them, and a blue value for the rest. And they just made up the bits they were missing. And then they save it as a JPEG, you know. And you get the, you're under the impression that the sensor actually got an RGB value for each thing, and it, and it didn't. So that's why some people import it as raw. And then you can, you know, in Photoshop, your so you can have more sophisticated software that might do a better job of doing the interpolation and stuff like that. You can see here the intermediate, oops, sorry. So if this was the image, this is what each, let me show you now. Okay, so if this was the image and its pixels, Okay, this is an unusually large image to illustrate a particular point, but bear with me. So, for each pixel then, if we were to go back up to where this image, we could, we could speculate which pixel we're looking at here. Because, well, that is what, what, what is up at the top. It's all green, isn't it? So, this is probably the, the red value here. That pixel is probably only reading the redness. And these two are the same, so that's probably with the greenness, which would be quite light. For a color green, the green would be light, and the blue, in this case, is a bit light too, because that's the shade of green. So these pixels here are only returning red values. So the red value for this pixel is interpolated. So you get something like this. Do you know what I mean? All you're getting back is a red value, a green value, and a blue value, and you have to kind of fake the rest of it. I think if you understand what I'm saying, this illustration is redundant, and actually I think if you don't understand what I'm saying, it doesn't actually help. So we'll, we'll, so we'll, we'll move on. Okay? So what I want to talk about now, something completely different, is interlaced video, which is still with us It's actually one of those things that upsets me. I don't know how some people can sleep at night if their databases aren't normalized. And this is also one of those things that troubles me, that we still have interlaced video when we don't need it. Okay? So, way, 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 way back. Let us imagine we are at the beginnings of television. This is a drawing of an oscilloscope, actually. It's not a TV but it's, a, it's still a, a cathode ray tube. So as they say in those um, L'Oreal ads, here comes the science bit. But your old-fashioned television, like the really, really heavy one, your not flat screen, the one that was as deep as it was wide, that's a giant cathode ray tube. And what you have is what's called an electron gun and this shoots out a stream of electrons, which you remember from physics class are not atoms, no, they are subatomic particles. It shoots electrons out, and you can, with a magnetic field, divert the electrons and point them in a particular direction. The earliest television was actually mechanical, and you would have a thing, an actual thing spinning around and stuff. But we went for electronic tele. We eventually decided electrons were the way to go. And so you have these electrons firing out of this electron gun, it's called, and it basically shoots at a screen. And this screen had a special chemical coating, which when it was hit by electrons would glow. And so you could organize the electronics such that you could... I'll do it from the point of view as if I'm the electron gun and you're the viewer. So, so the electron gun would shoot the direction, shoot the electrons in the order that we would like read. So it'd go like from top to right, left to bottom. So it'd start over here, you know, electrons, 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 electrons. This could be a good dance. Okay, we call it the the electro the CRT. Okay. Now you can imagine. 
if the stream of electrons was steady, then you would just get the screen glowing, okay? But if you were to vary the intensity of the electrons as they are being shot out of the electron gun, you could generate an image. So the parts of the image that were meant to be bright, you'd have more electrons. The parts of the image that were supposed to be dark or darker, you'd have fewer electrons. And where it's supposed to be completely dark, you'd have like no electrons being shot out at that particular time. And so you could build up an image that way. Okay? And so that was cathode ray tube, the beginnings of television. So you may have seen an oscilloscope in physics class in secondary school. They're really very, very close cousins to uh, a television. Over time, we put special, special phosphors on the screens so that they would glow a particular color, or we would have had filters again, another way to do it. But let's just think of black and white television for now, okay? So you have this electron gun shooting electrons at a screen, basically, and where they hit, they glow, and the glow fades. And this glow fading was a problem, you see. So if we take, say, PAL, which was the standard used in Europe, but not France, it had 625 lines, so it would go like 625 times, okay? The electron gun would go in and start from top to bottom. Now, in the early days of television, the problem was that the phosphors would start to fade. So you'd, the electrons would hit them, and they glow, but they'd fade away before the electron gun, before the shower of electrons came back again. And so you'd get this sort of um, banding, this sort of, you know, fading away, this kind of black band that would move down. And so they came up with a very clever idea, which was interlacing. Now, I'm visualizing this, and it's hard for us now in our digital pixel world to visualize this happening all in analog. And the way I'm drawing it on the screen even suggests that there's pixels. There are no pixels here now. Do you know what I mean? This is a bit of chemical, a bit of, you know, electric mojo on a screen causing it to glow. And the electron gun was doing 625 swipes across before going up and starting again. Okay? What interlacing does is, well, let, let's, let's say you're, you're an early television designer. Imagine what you do. Say, well, we start at the top, and the electron gun will come back, and we go again, and we go again, and we go again, and we build up the picture that way. And so you keep going, and keep going. And then we go back up. At this point, we go back up then, and we'd start again. So we get all our, our picture done that way. And the problem was that the phosphor, the chemicals, shut up machine. Oh God, there we go. No. The phosphor would fade before the electron gun would, the electrons would come back to that part of the screen again. So they decided, well how about we shoot every second line and then come back. So they would do the, it would do one set of lines, like it would do every second line basically. Okay, so it would do that much, right? And then come back up again and do the other parts. So if we were to look here, so like this part now, this line, okay, might already be starting to fade, but sure, we've got this part here, right next to it, and above and below it. So as, as the things were fading, it was like coming around twice, you see, twice as fast. So it made it 
look better. It didn't kind of fade away. Get the idea? So instead of doing the first line and then the second line, then the third line and the fourth line and the fifth line and the sixth line and the seventh line, it would do the first line, then the third line, then the fifth line, then the seventh line, then the ninth line, blah, 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 all the way down to 625. And then come back up and do number two, number four, six, eight, ten, and twelve. So that's interlacing. So although I might have told you, for example, that PAL was 25 frames per second, actually it wasn't 25 frames per second, it was 50 half frames. We do one half of it, ding, 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 ding. and then the next 50th of a second, come back up and do the other half of the lines. I'm trying to think of an analogy. I have a feeling it's not going to be very good. Okay. Were you ever at a bar where they're like squirting drink at people? <laughs> you haven't lived. Okay. So, they have these kind of like, you can squirt drink at people, right? Well, you know, if I was to, you know, squirt the first row of people, and then the next 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 row of people, you know, the fun would kind of move in waves, you know? But like if you were to squirt every second person, you know, even if you weren't getting a drink, the people around you would be like so happy that, you know, the buzz would be everywhere rather than just, you know, half the people happy all the time. So by spreading it around, you, you know, keep the buzz going. And the buzz here is that, that, that phosphor, I told you it wasn't going to be any good, but you know, I mean, I'm under pressure here, you know, and the same with the phosphor. So it's fading away, but whoop, whoop, the one next to it and above and below it, that's being lit up. So visually, at least, we, do, we don't notice so much. So interlacing has then some unfortunate side effects. And they're especially noticeable then when you're displaying them on a modern LCD or LED screen. Because that's a whole different technology. It's not like things are fading away, or you're seeing one half and then you're seeing the other half. Yeah, you know. So they don't fade on, a, on an LCD screen. And so what can happen is you have something like this. Can you see it? So the problem is that, who is this man, by the way? Okay. So. Instead of us seeing where he was at one point in time, and then we're seeing where he was one twenty-fifth of a second later, we're seeing where half of him was at one time, and then where the other half of him was one fiftieth of a second later. And unfortunately, we're seeing both of those things at the same time. So if he's moving fast, some of them is one fiftieth of a second behind the rest of them. If we zoom in, you see what I mean. Look. So he moved. I mean, he's a fast man. A fiftieth of a second, you know, he's running. So that interlacing there is very noticeable. Do you know what I mean? If you took a picture of him, it would look better than this because you've one picture from one instant in time. Here, we are looking at two instances from time. We're looking at the odd row of pixels and the even row of pixels that was captured a 50th of a second later, and we're displaying them at the same time. So instead of seeing something moving smoothly like this, we see this. My fingers here look, so it should look like this, but it's like this. You get this like of serrated edge. You will never enjoy a soccer match again now. And of course, the bigger the screen, the worse it is. You're going to see this from now on. And it's so annoying. And it's still done to this day when I, I could understand how when we had both digital and analog television on the go together, that if you had cameras at a football match, 
you would need them to work this way just to give something useful that you could feed into the analog folks. But we don't have analog television anymore. So there's really, in my opinion, there's no need for this at all. And there's some debate about that. I don't know, but there's no, there's no need for this. So now you have some sophisticated TVs then that have to do the work of actually removing this. So they'll interpolate the missing picks, the missing lines, so that they'll do all the odd ones and then make up the even ones, and then one fifty of a second later, they'll give you the even ones and make up the odd ones, so you don't have this. So you might find on a TV there's even a setting where you can make this go away. So if you take a screenshot of television, See, if, this, if I was showing you this live, you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice it so much, and you'd be caught up in the game and everything. But when you do take a screenshot, it's, it's really noticeable. And so your, your modern TV then may have to do some work to actually take this away. But if you're digitizing video, it's, it's a real pain, because you're going to display it on a computer that doesn't do any of this interlacing stuff. You just want, you know, one frame, and then the next frame. You don't want displayed in one frame things that happened at different points in time. You know, if they're standing still, it's not so bad. But if things are moving, you start, to, you start to see this. So you may start to notice this now, from now on, and you will curse me. So here we have a screenshot from a program that's um, ripping a DVD. And so this program here was coded using interlacing. So sometimes now when you get a DVD, you might find that it's interlaced, or you might find that it's not. <coughs> That's another thing actually that really annoys me, is that someone might take a film, which was not shot in video anyway. You, see, you know, if you take a film from 50 years ago, it's a bunch of still images. And you get the DVD, it might be a digitized version of the videotape that had been interlaced. So it could be displayed on television. And there's no excuse for that. That's just really shabby. So this program here that is taking video from a DVD source has an option where you can de-interlace the, the picture. So you can see there, this man is running. So he is in, in two places at the same time. He was in one place at one point in time. And then a 50th of a second later, he had moved a bit. But because interlaced video shows us the two points in time simultaneously, we get this, this interlacing, this jaggedness here. And actually, you would think if it's happening one twenty-fifth of a second, or you know, at worst, that often, you wouldn't notice that much. And it's actually quite noticeable. It's annoying. Again, this shuttlecraft here happens to be in two places at the one time. Which, as you know, can be useful if someone is shooting at you. But you know, it's not good if you're just watching. So it's moving quite fast. We could probably calculate how fast this was moving across the screen by measuring how far it had moved in that 50th of a second. We know this is 1 50th of a second, and then the other part of it is a 50th of a second later. So we could speculate it was going at a certain speed. No. Okay. So here again we have that image. So this is the interlaced, and then the software has removed the interlacing. And you can see it's much more satisfactory. Now it's done that by interpolation. So we may have sacrificed some, some detail and some crispness there, but at least you, know, you can see where someone is. It's really annoying in a football match when the ball is in two places at the one time. You know, that just frustrating for me anyway. You may not notice it if you're lucky, but I, once you know it's there, you see it everywhere. It's, it's horrible. No. So interlacing is still used even now then in digital TV transmission. So if you're watching a match on RTE tonight, it may be interlaced, when really I don't think there's any need anymore. And um, so that's... That's the argument that you can save some space, but I don't see how, actually. And I also think that 
something like this is really going to screw with your black matching algorithm. Unless it does them on odd and even, doesn't, you know, separates out the odd and even and does it on those. But I think actually interlacing would, would screw with your black matching as well. So I don't know. I think the argument is that it's good for bandwidth. I, 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 I don't know. I have my doubts. I'm skeptical on that one. I've yet to be convinced, which I suppose is not the same thing. I'm not speaking from a, a position of knowledge, but rather ignorance. But now, so I want to show you now this tool that we use for recoding video. So here is a very, very short video. Um, okay, actually, what's interesting, what's interesting is this was shot at very high resolution. It's in fact at such high resolution that the machine can't even play it back to you in real time, okay? I told you I needed a new machine. Um, so that's a problem there, okay? So this would actually, this was a smooth video. But it's jerky here because the machine can't display it back to you in real time. What I've done here is I have used this tool called Handbrake, which you can use to recode video with various parameters. So here I have recoded it at 15 frames a second. And it's quite smooth. I do find it is a little bit jerky. It's not quite, it's not quite convincing to me. No, in fairness, it's, ma it's many more pixels wide than fit on the screen at the moment. But even so, it, it's just a tiny, I think there's something slightly off with that. I think it's not smooth enough. Um, if I show you at 10 frames a second, you'll see there that it's clearly then, this is just this jerkiness here, you know? So I think 15 frames per second is as low as you could go. And I think even the 15 frames per second, I was, not, I was not convinced by that. I wasn't happy with that. Here we have it at 5 frames per second. <coughs> and something has come a cropper here. It's not going to play for me. OK. So I'll just briefly now show you how Handbrake works. Many people use Handbrake to rip DVDs. So if you buy a DVD, for example, in Tesco or Amazon, and you want to put it on your iPhone or your Apple TV or watch it on your laptop that doesn't have a DVD drive, you need to actually copy it off the DVD and then you need to save it then as a, as a, as a movie file. The DVDs are encrypted, though, to stop you doing that. So it turns out Handbrake doesn't actually crack the encryption. There is another software tool which plays back videos, but it doesn't rip them. And so the people that designed Handbrake have sort of set up this kind of firewall between themselves and the illegal activity. But if you happen to have a piece of software that's breaking into the DVD, well, they're happy to talk to it, but they're not actually doing the, the cracking themselves. In the past, Handbrake would have done all the different parts of the job. I could show you that, but actually, there's a very good chance if I showed you that the how to do that, even though it's trivially, you just plug it in and blah, 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 blah. There's a very good chance that the recording of the class would probably be taken down from YouTube because it would be breaking the law, of course. You know, I would be circumventing the encryption on a DVD or even talking about doing it and showing someone how to do it and explaining how to do it would be against the law in the US. Um, well, talking about doing it could be against the law. So, but I'm going to show you how Handbrake works for that video I made earlier. So, it does give you, for example, a number of predefined parameters that you could use. So if you knew it was going to be on an iPad or on a, an iPhone or whatever, you can have pre-selected parameters. I'm just going to say Apple TV 2 here. 
But what I find interesting is that you can set the size, for example. So the original video I had was 1280 by 720, which is bigger than the screen we're looking at now. And you can, you know, change the size. I'm just going to say maybe 800 by whatever. I can't type it in, can I? No, I'll just go down there. So it'll take forever. Okay. And there are a number of things you can do. This is going to take a while. Um, I'll just bring it down to maybe 800 or something. Interestingly, inside in the filters, there's a very useful option to deinterlace. And also, it even gives you options within that because you can turn off the deinterlacing or you can decide that you're only going to deinterlace where things are moving really, really fast. So it can detect if objects are moving fast, well, I'll deinterlace those. But if they're moving slower, I won't. Because, of course, if they're really moving really, really slow, the impact of the interlacing is going to be minimal. So if you had a video of me sitting here talking and you didn't remove the interlacing, it wouldn't be so bad. If I was doing my CRT dance, you know, um, then you would notice the interlacing more. So it gives you options there. But what's fantastic is that obviously you can set the frame rate and stuff and whatnot, and you can choose your codec and you can choose your audio and blah, blah, blah. That's all very interesting. But what I find fascinating is that you can actually go into the settings for the compression and at least you used to be able to anyway you could go in and you could set for example the yeah you could set for example the frequency of the i frames and the p frames you could decide whether you wanted to do a uh, very broad search in the block matching or whether you wanted to be more constrained. So you could even, you can specify like, I really care about this video, so I want you to take ages and pour over it. You could do like one or two passes. You could just, you know, take your time. Or you could say, eh, you know, not so much. I'm not so fussy. Fly through this. I want you to compress it in a reasonably short time. So you have control over all these parameters. I had hoped you to show you all the, yeah, so look all the different parameters here. So, you know, motion estimation method. Remember I talked about block matching algorithms. Here it's giving you a choice of block matching schemes. So the exhaustive one would probably be really, really slow. You can do adaptive B frames. Subpixel motion estimation. Remember when we talked about block matching and you say, well, a, a block might have moved one pixel away or two pixels over and three pixels up. You could consider, well, maybe it's moved two and a half pixels over and three and a half pixels up. Now, how do you move half a pixel? Well, by interpolating what it would have looked like if it was between there and there. You can turn that on and off, which again would give you more sophisticated results. The quality of the resulting video might be better but of course it would take an awful lot longer to compress. So if this is pictures of you in the pub with your buddies, you just want to get it up into Facebook nice and quick, you don't care. If this is your Academy Award, you know, you're a shoe in provided it's coded properly, you're going to say to the compression algorithm, this is precious to me. You know, take your time. I'll wait three days. I'll make sure no one plugs out the power. So you have all these options inside in just saying look the maximum number of b frames that you have in a row so i would say oh, i have 16 b frames back to back i don't care if this was at you know 25 frames a second that's a good half second you might start to see over that half second the quality start to give you know here we're specifying the minimum number of reference frames, all these things. So you could go into great detail here in specifying each of these different options, but you, you'd have to read the manual and you'd have to understand all of that stuff we talked about when we were outlining 
how video compression works in great detail. So Handbrake is a great tool. You would use it, in this case, for example, I have a video that's way too big. It's so big I can't even display it on this crappy machine. I could recode it in such a way that it would play just fine. So I'll do that right now. I'll, I've already resized it a little bit, haven't I? I'll just resize it a bit more. Okay, so now it's only 700 and odd pixels wide, and I will do it at the original number of frames per second, whatever that was, um, and we'll see how we go. The queue there, just add that to the queue. Sorry, um, just call that new. Add that to the queue, show the queue, kill that away we go and then depending on how fast the machine is this would take a little while or a long while this movie is only 10 seconds long and this is coding it at slightly less than it's doing there look about seven or eight frames per second so you can see it's already now taking longer to compress than it is to play back and of course we already discussed this at length video compression is asymmetrical. It takes longer to compress a video than it takes to decompress it. How long does it take to decompress this video? Well we don't know exactly but if we can play it in 11 seconds then we know it's worst case scenario it takes 11 seconds to decompress it. It's taken more than that to compress it. Let us open that video there. It's called, it should be on the desktop. Desktop is here, most recent thing is here. So now we have the same, the same video, but it's not as wide anymore. And it should play more smoothly. Were you happy with that? I'm not happy. I find that when you have something panning like that I think the block matching sort of it, it, it decides that something hasn't moved when it actually has and so instead of being a smooth movement it kind of goes dum, dum, dum. It says it hasn't moved and I say okay it really has and you get this kind of um, jerkiness I think that's slightly jerky there when it should be smooth can you see it? maybe you can't maybe I'm just you know and I, I see that a lot with stuff that I've, I've coded. The block matching doesn't really, the, the algorithm doesn't detect, or actually something is moving. It's moving from left to right or up and down, and I should just go with that. Whereas the instinct of the block matching algorithm is to say, well, it hasn't really changed much, so we're gonna declare it as non-moved. Non You'll all often see as well sometimes, a, like if something is moving, it might decide that well, actually, this part is moving and this part isn't. And sometimes bits of a person's face don't quite all move together like they should. And it can be quite disturbing, but you don't quite put your finger on it, what's happening. But now that you understand what's happening, I'll hopefully have ruined your, your, your viewing pleasure. Okay? So, I'm um, going to have a lab in a minute so you can work on your assignments. If you don't feel the need to go there, you don't have to. There'll be nothing new or anything there. There'll be no new or startling insight and the next class on Thursday tomorrow will be a tutorial and then next week the first two classes at least anyway will be about audio